So thanks very much. Um, I'm Joe Curley, and I, and I lead, um, let me see if I can get back to the beginning of this. Um, I'd also want to, to pass along uh, some thank yous. As I look around this, uh, this audience, I recall the very first, the genesis of the Xeon Phi user group in a meeting, originally with Melissa, Dan Stanzioni, and a number of people going back to the, the beginning of Knight's Corner. And we were talking about the challenges of trying to uh, build applications for the many core era. And I'm really going to spend a little bit of time talking about that today. And uh, the, the title is, you know, a look backwards and forwards. I want to talk a little bit about the history of how we got here and why we're he why we have a product like Xeon Phi, but also maybe a little uh, maybe a little bit uh, at the end on where we're going. But thanks very much to the steering committee. Thanks very much, David and team, for putting the, the facilities together. I've had the pleasure of being in Ostrava and in uh, St. Petersburg uh, previously for meetings, uh, and also at ISC. And I was stunned when we actually sold out the the largest venue that was available for the paid tutorials. So there's clearly a lot of interest in building highly parallel applications. And so for all of you who made the trip out here, uh, again, thanks. And I hope that it's, uh, you'll look back on it and um, think that it was a worthwhile use of a few days. Uh, I wanted to put, start off with uh, just some context again. Everyone, there's all this hype that you see in the industry, Moore's Law is dead, or blah, 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 or you know, frequencies ended. And I thought I'd just put a little bit of data behind this to say that I plotted every data center CPU produced uh, by Intel going back to um, uh, really the, the, going, the, 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 you know, the genesis of Intel processors and up through what we're building today. And the plot that you end up seeing is that frequency uh, had a beautiful, a beautiful linear progression uh, act, or um, up a, um, and it all of a sudden went completely and totally flat at around 2002, 2003. Okay, everyone knows that. There's no more free lunch. Frequency alone is not going to be able to get, uh, give you more performance. But that doesn't mean that Moore's Law by any means is dead. If you plot the, uh, the amount of the number of transistors that are used on a data center CPU over time, you know, that, that progression continues. And it doesn't stop. Um, and we won't stop for the next several years. You know, four or five years from now, we can, we can argue about where things end up going. But, but simply, Moore's Law is passed on and on. And, and, and that provides a couple of things. One, the, the transistors get more energy efficient. And we have a whole lot more of them. So how do you use those if the frequency is flat? And the answer has been parallelism. And you know, we've, we've, we've created increasingly energy efficient, increasingly parallel architectures. And just to use cartoons to try to make the point, if you go back to take a look at a, a Prescott processor from um, the, the early 2000s, I mean, the whole die area is cache and, and CPU. Uh, it was a SIMD4 unit, uh, would issue uh, one, you know, one SIMD every two clocks. Uh, if you take a look just back about uh, four years ago, as Ivy Bridge was coming out, this is a, a 10, I believe a 10 core Ivy Bridge, uh, you can count them. Uh, you end up t taking a look at how much is one core if you're using it as, a, as a, how much of the die area are you actually using if you're using only one core. And then we take, a, again, a, another sh uh, a shot and look at Knight's Landing, which now is a, is a large array of very, very small cores, low power cores, and the SIMD width has increased to 16. It's an incredibly parallel machine. It should be intuitive, but if you wrote your applications in a Prescott or pre-Prescott era, the chances that you're getting optimal performance out of a night's landing are actually remarkably slim. And uh, we'll, we'll, talk, uh, we'll, we'll try to show some graphs and story tell on that. But as an opening thought, I thought I would uh, quote Steve Jobs, because to some degree, most of you in this room are going to prove Steve Jobs wrong over the course of the next couple of days. Uh, we, you know, shortly after joining Intel uh, to plan the many core product line, I open up the newspaper and see this quote from Steve Jobs saying that, you know, uh, the way the processor industry is going, more and more cores, but nobody knows how to program them. Uh, Peter, I'm lo not looking at you right now. Uh, nobody has, knows how to program these things. I mean, two, yeah, four, not really, eight, forget it. Well, I'll come back to that idea because if you're writing an efficient code on a night's landing today, you're not only writing for 64 plus cores, but you're dealing with multiple th execution threads, SIMD per, and trying to deal with, the, with memory types. Um, now, we've tried to do a lot in tools to make it a bit easier, but a lot of it just comes down to thinking and parallel programming. Xeon Phi's we intended from the beginning to make easy to program, but that doesn't make programming easy. So taking a look at where we, how we got here, um, shortly after joining Intel, I hooked up with uh, some researchers out of Intel Labs who had done research in something they called recognition, mining, and synthesis. The, the synthesis is very much simulation science. The rec recognition and mining are 
probably what people are thinking of today as um, um, artificial intelligence and data science. But the, the, the genesis of ZBrush actually came from the idea of combining what people now think of machine learning and, um, and simulation science, high performance computing. Um, and you can read the papers, they're, they're on the web um, if, if you feel like Googling them. In any case, um, we, we went through multiple iterations and product investigations and to the chart that, that was shown a little bit earlier by Richard, one of the biggest problems we had at Intel was trying to beat a Xeon. Because actually, if you wrote optimal code on a Xeon, if you, if you took that, if you found a way to write that second iteration of code that he showed earlier, it, it's really difficult to beat it. So we had to try to find a way to prove that using a lot of low power cores uh, in parallel with efficient code could actually beat it. We did that in uh, the beginning of 2010 and found a way to get the Xeon Phi product line um, uh, brought forward. But it's interesting that Xeon Phi is actually not an Intel-driven idea. It came from some of you in the room, and some, some of the people in this room were people we talked to during the planning, and they said, look, uh, you know, we're going to have to try to achieve a new level of science that we actually can't afford to power, the, the power bill for trying to build a machine at, you know, at, at the deep petascale or exascale uh, for using the current Xeon technology or the linear uh, extract of where Xeon was going was just going to be too power hungry and too expensive. We want to have the benefits of general programmability. We would like to reuse as much of our codes and algorithms as we can but we need a highly energy efficient design. And that was what we tried to do with Xeon Phi. We got some things right, uh, and we got some things very, very wrong, and I'll try to talk about some of those in a second. One of the things that we got right, I'm pleased to say, um, was I, 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 I pinched a quote from one of the developers of VASP uh, at a shop that was done, or a workshop that was done in Darsbury last winter. And he was comparing efforts that he'd done on an accelerator version for the GPU and uh, versions that they were working on to try to gain scale on Xeon and on Phi. And um, he, you know, both, both could end up delivering performance for different kinds of solutions. But the real advantage that they were excited about was that they were still using Fortran code. The science was exactly the same. They were still able to read the code and scientists were able to, uh, to modify it. Uh, I hope we'll actually tell more of that story uh, at the upcoming HPC Developers Conference. But you know, the idea is we tried to get it to be a generally programmable device that you could, you could take the best of your, your past and carry it forward into a highly parallel uh, way. And we've seen some results that, that, that back that up. And for a first generation product, I, I planned Knight's Corner. Uh, it, 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 it had its warts, it, it, but it was incredibly successful. And we had tons of good science done on our first generation product. But most of all, we created a, a product in some ways that you had to work and really, if you, if you didn't do the work to really extract the parallelism, if you could not get uh, it to scale out to all the cores, it was going to decelerate and it was going to dis decelerate in a profound way. If you did the opposite, what you did is you gained scale in the code that allowed portability to the fu architectures of the future. And so it was, it, was, it was a Rubicon for us, once crossed, gave us a, a, she a real idea of how much work we had to do in the community to try to upgrade scientific applications that we've been living on for 30, 40 years. That's led to a number of activities, including the Xeon Phi user group, but, um, but we learned an enormous amount. I, 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 there are uh, a whole series of textbooks in the back, but if, you've, if anybody here is familiar with the Pearls books done by uh, J uh, James Reinders and Jim Jeffers, one of the things we tried to do was write down uh, a lot of the experiences scientifically, algorithmically, and in terms of computational science of how people got highly parallel applications written. One of the uh, is from the second book is a study from Cambridge's Department of Advanced Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. And it, in some ways, it's very typical of the story that Richard just uh, pointed to you. And, and here are some of his bar charts. Uh, so what we're starting off with is an original code, and then we're going through a series of uh, kind of standard optimization techniques, simplifying loops, uh, um, adding MKL, inlining some code, and we're continuing to gain perform, we're, we're gaining speed ups over the baseline of the code, one after another after another. But what you end up finding by the time you get down to a nice cache block version of the code is what most people found on Knight's Corner which is I, I improved the Xeon code six and a half times. I got the Knight's 
uh, the Knight's Corner to equal a little better than one of the, in this case, Sandy Bridges, I'm happy with Xeon. So you, you could actually conclude at this point that, you know, that modal, the application that's using, is it's really, it's a Xeon application. We should stop. It's, you know, we're done. And we heard this uh, quite a bit. And one of the reasons we started up a group that John Pennycook and a number of other people have done is to continue to advance the thinking to the next, to the next level. And wh what we found was is that almost everything we taught, all of the tools that we used, all of the, the tutorials we put together, used a tried and true method, a very evolutionary process. You'd identify hot spots in your code. You know, we'd, we'd go off and try to find a parallel region. We'd go pound that with some pragmas. We'd go off, widen it, read compiler reports back, look back at vectorization, rinse, repeat. And you know, you're constantly taking one code and you're, you're in the process of optimizing and perfecting that particular code to its nth state. At the second uh, meeting of the Xeon Phi user group in Dublin uh, at uh, iCheck, we brought forward a slightly different experience. We said, there's a, there, you know, logically, this process of, of, iterate, of constantly iterating on the same code and not going back and really looking at the structure of the science and the problem and how to make it parallel, um, it'll get you so far, but it may not get you where you want to go. And so there's a, there's, there was a combination of both a very evolutionary approach to programming, and then there's a time you just have to stop, sit back, look at the problem, and figure out whether or not it's going to scale, it really does scale. So you go off and take a look at your algorithm, examine it, design a new one, and then go back into an iterative process. And to try to make that point, we'll continue the rest of the modal case study. What happens after that is that uh, right, right after they got through the, the blocking and getting to cache efficiency and had um, perfected the, the algorithm for uh, you know, that code that they had, they went back and took a look at the numerical integration routines in the center of the code. And they, they tried to think about how they would be able to design that for a very, very wide machine. Now, John, uh, you can wave your hand back there, actually worked with the Cambridge team on this. And I won't em uh, embarrass either John or uh, myself by trying to get through the, the re-architecture of the code. But as John's the, the, one of the uh, chapter's uh, authors, he can explain it to you in great detail. But now, all of a sudden, we've moved from a 6x increase in performance on the Xeon to a 60x increase in performance. And for all the, all the talk of accelerators and GPUs and FPGAs, and the, the, the fundamental lesson one takes away from this is that the only 10x increases in performance come from software and algorithmic design. And then the hardware does as good a job as the hardware can do on top of it. But if you're not looking at your software design, you never actually get that 10x. But now that they're into a new, uh, a new design that really does scale to all the cores, is hybrid in parallelism, is, is uh, messaging across the cluster, is very memory efficient, uh, they can start now back to the evolutionary approach, looking at the reduction algorithms, looking at data alignment, Knight's Corner, you had to align data or you got punished, and then taking a look at tuning the prefetches. And all of a sudden, the Knight's Corner is, uh, is well over 2.5, 2.6 of the Xeon. And the Xeon itself, from its baseline, has also increased uh, somewhere on the or order of 50x. In the end, the, l the last version of modal, I believe, was about 100 times faster than they started. And interestingly, with a 100 times smaller data footprint as well, meaning they not only sped up what they were doing, but through effective use of shared memory, they were also able to run much, much larger problem sizes on a very modest cluster. Science that could not be done now can be. And th so the idea is, um, if, you know, really take a look back at the cycle of how you're approaching the problem. And when you, when you hit a barrier and go, I'm not sure that, that you know, really, um, you know, should I be staying with the, the, the Xeon processor or should I be sca scaling on to something like the Xeon Phi, don't, don't just stop at the first wall. There is a, there's a time that, that people have to go back and think. Uh, I warned Jack that I was going to use one of his slides. I frequently, uh, uh, I frequently use this when talking. Um, there, I think there are a couple versions of this one, but the, the, uh, back in October of 2013, um, I, I saw this presentation. If you do nothing, your MPI-only code may run poorly on future machines. Um, I thought it was very delicately said, Jack. <laughs> um, because, because the reality is, is that if you're moving, for, if you've got something that has a, a giant serial, you know, a giant barrier, a giant serial problem built into it, and you're moving to a core that has a third of the serial performance, 
And then you're going to scale it. You can kind of imply mathematically what's about to happen to you. Um, but in a picture, the, the, uh, one of the other Xeon Phi user groups, the guys from Parsec, did a, a, a great presentation. It would take my full half hour. But uh, I decided to gray out all but three of the slides. And you can kind of take from the pictures what they're getting at. If you take a look at the, uh, the initial before state of the application and the amount of time lost to barriers, um, it, you know, it's, it's the vast majority of the runtime of the application. Now, they've gone through a series of then of trying to create a hybrid application um, and balancing things back out, then taking 96 CPUs across 96 MPI processes, and then implementing the, the, share, the hybrid parallelism by the time you get to the end of it. They've, they've increased the performance uh, n fold getting to the, the modern code on the 96 CPUs, but then took another 35% uh, out of, uh, of efficiency coming just from balancing the MPI and the OpenMP regions. So, uh, you know, again, the, to try to get back to Jack's point, if you're just saying, I have an MPI application, I'm hoping that, the, that in a sense what I have is a 68 core Xeon, you know, you might be disappointed, but there are, uh, there, are, there are standard methods, tools, and uh, uh, ways of solving the problem using both OpenMP and using MPI uh, to try to get much more efficient codes. So we learned a whole lot on Ninth Corner. Um, we were able to deliver performance, and we created a crucible, if you will, that to test code on, um, and got to the point where we're coming out to, to figure, how do we get some of that, that data out? We, we started to see... Um, we started to see uh, performance numbers, but, we're, but to Steve Jobs' point, uh, it's not that you can't create an application that can run really, really well on a highly parallel architecture. It's that we haven't necessarily trained people to do so, and we haven't, we haven't evangelized why one should. Uh, it, um, going back and looking at your codes is really expensive. It's really time consuming, and if you're going to do it, we advise do it once and do it in a way that is as portable and scalable as possible. And at the risk of being controversial, as portable on and off Intel processors as is possible. The, um, almost every microprocessor architecture is built on top of fundamental capabilities, cores, caches, some form of, of SIMD, and some form of threading. So if you have a good structured parallel program at a cluster level and at a processor level, you're going to optimize it for each individual architecture. But you should be able to get a great deal of reuse. And that was a, the idea behind Xeon Phi. But we, we, we really didn't have a method to have those conversations. So we started taking a look uh, back in 2013 about different methods that we could have to share information. One of them was the textbooks that you see in the back. Uh, things like Intel Parallel Computing Centers, where uh, we started to uh, invest in work in training or supporting communities to work on various different community codes. Um, working with researchers and helping share data from Intel Labs and some of our own researchers with leading academics. Um, teachers, uh, if you haven't seen it, um, I went back to my alma mater, Penn State University, and I was going to talk to the, com the computer science department and, and uh, about training parallel programmers, because we like to hire programmers and they like to have their students be hired. And uh, they, uh, they ended up coming back and saying, oh yeah, well we're using this, uh, this wonderful curriculum for parallel programming developed by Alan Maloney out at the University of Oregon. Alan's currently on a Fulbright uh, scholarship over uh, in Versailles, France. But that was an, actually an, uh, an Intel Parallel Computing Center funded uh, development. I was thrilled to see that it had, had uh, gone all the way out to uh, my own alma mater. So working with teachers, trying to build general knowledge into the, the skills of parallel programming. And from this, we tr we're hoping to try to create events like this and, and communities like this where we're talking, we're using, the, we're using the workshops, we're using the performance meetings that John and, and Georg and um, uh, Michael are running to share the best practices among the community of what's working and not working and try to, try to uh, help really uh, drive and evangelize the many core era. And I can't underestimate the value of the community. In, in the two books that we published on without, with kind of the proceedings of some of the first couple of years, uh, 48 or so chapters, some stronger than others, but many brilliant that talk about um, you know, how to write scalable algorithms for the kinds of machines that we're going to be building in the future. So one of the things that I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping for coming out of this conference is you know, continue to share webcast, teach, you know, work with your students, work with your communities, and find ways to be able to talk, uh, you know, talk and, and incent people to, um, to, to uh, copy the best practices. 
One interesting note, if you happen to have any uh, computer scientists or, or, or um, uh, budding computer scientists in your family or friends, on Wall Street, the, uh, the, pr the salary of a parallel programmer capable of optimizing a, uh, an algorithm is twice that of a general programmer. Uh, so if you, if, you want to, if you want to get to the point of saying, is there a value in learning how to do this for science, it's clear, but if you're just uh, chasing a dollar, it's not a bad idea either. So we get to Knight's Landing, and here's a slide that I had prepared for, uh, for the Ostrava meeting. And this was, uh, we wanted to give a little sneak peek of what, of, what Z of what we saw from Knight's Landing, because as everybody knows, prior to a launch, you can't talk about the performance of a part, and it's kind of frustrating in the community. What all of the, forget for a moment the, which each, what each of these applications are. The baseline is saying optimized code running, not the original code, but optimized code running on a Haswell compared to two or two Haswells top bin um, uh, versus uh, one night's landing. Um, it, it, there are lots of reasons why we choose that. It's not exactly a great power to power uh, argument, but it's pretty much a node to node discussion. So it was, it was a useful point of comparison. And if you, know, if you take some of the things like uh, highly, optimized, uh, hi highly optimized kernels for seismic imaging or Monte Carlo evaluations, you know, the, the kind of poster child applications for parallelism, you end up seeing roughly an 8x increase in performance over a single Broadwell or 4.n times over two. Looks really, really good. What was most interesting to us is the far end of the chart, the, the low bars which were applications that we pulled out of the box, did no work on whatsoever, and ran and got them to roughly being equal in performance to a single Broadwell. And to Richard's earlier point, a whole lot of stuff was close to his uh, Haswell plus 20 right out, of the, right out of the gate. There's good news and bad news in that for us. Uh, the good news is it makes it easier to sell the part. You know, the fact that you can run massive numbers of your legacy applications reasonably well. Uh, and Peter, if you're, uh, I see people staring. If these slides are posted, <laughs> so you can, you can examine which applications, and they've changed since this slide uh, we're looking at. But I think the broader point here that is a little bit concerning to me is if the, result, the results are almost good enough that you go, it's good enough, I don't have to look. Uh, you know, um, there, because a number of these applications are actually w like, not unlike modal, great targets for a little bit of revolutionary change that can unlock new science for the next decade. Remember, because what we're doing here is, you know, we're not writing a code that, uh, hopefully we're not writing a code for the next year or two. We're writing codes that will be running in our deep petascale and exascale machines. And reality is, not unlike the Parsec slides, while the individual node performance of these may look really, really good, at s they still may have problems scaling. So the, I think the encouraging thing to us was the performance of, of Knight's Landing was uh, shockingly good. Andreas Stiller, when he did his first look at this uh, after ISC, noted that the, it was the spec, uh, the spec rate FP champion. It had broken the record. But, his, but he spent more time talking about the fact that the spec int was shockingly good, and it was a pretty good throughput machine. That's true, but don't, but don't be lulled to sleep by it. Um, to that end, one of the things we've tried, um, we tried to, to, for the first time uh, ever, is to make it a little bit easier uh, to write code for, uh, for a night's landing. Um, it's good if you happen to have a supercomputer in your lab, if you're one of these sites, but if you are a developer at a university and you, you, know, you can't be logging in constantly to make small iterative changes, you need a little bit more of a productive environment. So we went out last, oh, about a year and a half ago, and um, created a couple of partnerships with uh, an ODM as well as with Colfax to create a Knight's Landing workstation, uh, which uh, we, we decided to make pretty easy to access. We put a, a website up called DAP, Developer Access Program, at xeonfi.com. And this is something that, uh, that uh, you can just go grab uh, fully installed with Linux, with all of the Intel tools on it, and get, get up, log in, and um, start developing code immediately. The initial, uh, the, the, I hate to do this kind of show, does anybody have access to a DAP, or has anybody in the room seen one? Uh, quick, quick, uh, uh, quick show of hands. Uh, of the ones who've seen it, good experience? Yeah, pretty much the same. So uh, one of the things we've, we've tried to do, and it, it was not cheap uh, to put this together, but it was something that we hope will help, will help people in sent going after kind of the tail end of that distribution and taking a look at you know, building out the parallelism in the code. Um, 
in any case, it's something we have out there for, for academics. So, the, you know, the kind of to, to summarize where we got to, we, we, we were asked to build a highly power efficient architecture and uh, to try to find a way to keep as much reuse of code, but also we learned the lessons that um, you know, as, as ready as we thought our marketplace was for, for uh, Knight's Corner even, it wasn't. We've tried to do a lot of work and we've tried to build ways to disseminate it. Um, let's talk a, just briefly about some of the different futures and some of the hot topics that are going on in the uh, industry. You, know, um, you can't, I can't seem to open a periodical, four years ago I couldn't open a periodical without hearing the word cloud. Uh, two and a half years ago, I couldn't hear it without big data. This year, I can't uh, hear it without uh, either hearing machine learning or deep learning. Um, but there is so, there's, there's, there's definitely value behind the hype. Um, one of the things that, that, that uh, people have started to look at is we've cr created these increasingly parallel machines. We, we have been able to start taking a look at new learning algorithms, uh, whether it's uh, something that's cognitive or whether we're working through deep learning or something statistical. Uh, the machines are able to, uh, you know, <coughs> where, where we don't have a formula, we don't have a Navier Stokes, we, you know, we don't have uh, the Dirac, we don't have Dirac to tell us how to solve a problem. We're finding machines to help us find ways to solve those problems through a variety of different methods. But one of the things that uh, I is missing in the conversation is one how nascent we are today algorithmically. Um, we're uh, one, um, one quote that I'd heard recently is, you know, everything is, everything is a convolution through uh, GEM because, you know, a couple of grad students started that a few years ago and it took off. You know, and so it, there's, you know, the question is, what, um, you know, what other methodologies algorithmically can we do that are even more efficient? Even inside, just looking at convolutional networks. So as, if you take a look at uh, how much things are going to evolve over the course of the next several years, there, there's a real adva uh, advantage in bringing out that vision that Pradeep started with back on the, the recognition, mining, and synthesis papers, uh, Pradeep Dubey being an Intel fellow who uh, drove, the, drove that research back in the, the mid-2000s. Exactly where he said things were going was you wanted to have, if you, if you wanted to build a great general infrastructure for uh, recognition and, and mining, you wanted to have a highly programmable, highly parallel, um, highly memory efficient architecture. Well, that's a pretty good description of Knight's Landing. And that's exactly where, uh, where, you know, where we're, we're hoping to go. Um, You'll end up seeing over, the, one of the problems that has come about from s the way some of the, um, the frameworks have evolved is they are effectively um, serial frameworks with a highly parallel region or an offload region. And uh, th there's good, in, good news and that bad news in that. The good news is it really does get at the data parallelism and the symbiotization, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't make it terribly general for a lot of different kinds of machines. Uh, we're going through the process right now of working through all of the major um, uh, all the major frameworks ourselves with IPCCs, with the community. Um, we have recently uh, announced uh, partnerships with the Alan Turing Institute in the UK, and uh, even more recently, uh, one with, the, the, um, with uh, NERSC around Cori, where we're going to be focusing on uh, both, the, both underlying computation as well as building out the parallel frameworks that become scalable at the node level to general purpose processors, but also across the machine. So you can you, you, the scale up problems people are solving left and right, but we're also looking heavily at the scale out problems that we can get to through machine learning. And so what we'll be building is, um, whether it's through, our, through uh, classical analytics, uh, we, we have something we call our trusted analytics platform for pretty much the MapReduce community. And then uh, the standard machine learning frameworks, we've already posted Intel Cafe and Intel Teano. Uh, both are up on the web. If you, you can search, I don't have the Intel website here, but you can go download those now and start to practice with them. But one of the main things that we've done is, that's a little bit new is our approach to the underlying libraries. So everybody's familiar with, math, with Intel's math kernel library and you know, the access to you know, gem or to batch gem or batched FFTs. But one of the things that we've, uh, we've done that's a little bit different in our, in our model for development is a new product we call MKL DNN, or, so, or uh, MKL for, um, for neural networking. Breaking from our history, MKL DNN is actually an open source project. And so it's freely contributed to by the community and accessible by the community. Now, things, things that, one of the problems we have with MKL is that 
it's a product used by professional developers. It's also an opportunity, but it, it, what makes the product so strong is that it's, it's reliable, predictable, and can be you know, brought in by commercial ISVs and will always get a different result across a wide variety of Intel hardware. But that means it sometimes takes time to get the latest technology into the libraries. By opening up MKLDNN, if, if we come out with either from our researchers or in an IPCC or through one of our uh, cooperative or, or community partnerships or something you're doing, uh, we can actually bring that right into the project, make it available, and as we harden it, we can bring it into the main line of MKL or we can leave it in MKL DNN. So, so um, th the idea here is to be able to uh, bring some of the advantages of an open library. Um, you know, there are, there are libraries for GPUs, there are libraries for FPGAs, there are libraries for lots of different things, but we're trying to get an open uh, CPU-oriented uh, library for the underlying um, uh, computational kernels, be it FFTs, uh, GEMS, whatever else and allow people to contribute to that and take from it. Um, recently, Diane Bryant announced uh, at uh, the Intel Developers Forum a new part. I think you guys, uh, up to date, people are obviously familiar with, familiar with Knight's Landing. Um, you may know of uh, Knight's Mill, which will be the next, uh, next follow-on uh, to Knight's Landing. Um, a new part has uh, now is coming out on the roadmap, and it's pretty much drive it, driven by the deep learning community. And the idea here is to get to peak single precision uh, and mixed precision floating point uh, per, uh, performance. Uh, so an idea of a generally pro of a generally programmable CPU large memory uh, system, it's not unlike what you're doing with Knight's Landing, but really uh, really drive up the um, the variable the single and uh, variable precision calculations. Uh, this will be available, uh, we expect, sometime, uh, sometime next year. If you, you pick it, it'll be you know, the middle of next year is probably a safe guess. Um, but it's, it's going to be for people that are really taking more of an appliance look at deep learning or a single, certain single precision applications. If you, if you really want to hone in on the best possible power performance, but still do so in a general way, uh, it's a new product that will be coming from us. And that, was, that may have caught a few people a little bit by surprise uh, in that it's a, uh, it's a um, a new derivative uh, into the product line. Pretty exciting, though. So, um, I guess if we were to, to go to our last trend, um, in order to get to exascale, uh, people, everyone's trying to figure where the power has to leave the system. Uh, some people look at data movement, others look at, oh, caches are unnecessary, uh, we can take it out of here, there, other things. One thing that we really can try to save power on is I.O. Um, and one of the things that Moore's Law enables us to take a look at over time is greater levels of integration. So you can continue to put more and more powerful cores in, but as we get deeper into the roadmap, you can take a look at things like fabric, you can look at memory, you can take a look at um, the compute, in a sense get to an, a high performance computing uh, system on chip. More and more can be integrated into the package. And so th this actually is going to be a requirement um, we, uh, if in order to build en the energy efficient systems, we really f have to find a way to get rid of copper and line drivers. So uh, we're, we're going to continue to, to focus on that with the target of generality, performance, and, um, and integration around open and community-based software models. So while the hardware itself is going to become more and more integrated, uh, the the, the approach to the networking interfaces will still be open, op whether it's you know, open fabrics, MPI. The, the approach to programming is still hopefully going to be some derivative of MPI, open MP, uh, hopefully a converged one uh, that will uh, meet some of the DOE's requirements. So we're going to continue to invest in driving that integration for the idea of energy efficiency, and you'll start to see, you know, the first step in a sense is Knight's Landing as memory came on die, but there's more that we can do uh, with fabric on, fabric on package, and then eventually integration to try to continue to, to um, build uh, bigger and better machines. And I guess since we're here at Argonne, I, I, I would probably be remiss if I didn't give a quick plug for how some of that will actually uh, first be seen in the marketplace. And um, uh, David, you could probably give this pitch better than I can. But you know, a machine that will um, you know be up to uh, you know or greater than 180 petaflops. But with, with new and novel technologies of memory per node, per, you know, performance per watt, um, uh, 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 you know, a, a large step function, 6x more energy efficient. Uh, so 
uh, we're really looking forward in the project to get ready for Aurora. And, to, and, and the, the thing is that the, all the work that we're doing today on the applications, all of the investments that we're making in building out the scalable codes, hopefully will unlock the science of this, this caliber of leadership machine, which is, which is really a step on where we're trying to get to um, for uh, whether it's a buzzword or not for exascale, but for, for computing at massive scales and solving problems, uh, you know, truly massive problems. Well, one last uh, shameless plug uh, before I go. Uh, um, Richard did mention uh, that we were having the uh, HPC Developers Conference in Salt Lake City. Uh, the Developers Conference actually evolved out of a round table that Intel used to hold the day before, um, the day before supercomputing. And it's expanded into a two-day conference. This, this year we had, um, we had something on the order of three times more paper submissions than we had uh, the, year, the previous year. We completely, uh, we, we had great papers we unfortunately had to turn away. Uh, because the, the, the quality of the papers that we got was, uh, you know, in, you know it, uh, reflecting some of the good work that's being done in the community, the, the quality was awesome. We'll have four different uh, tracks built into it. One will be on parallelism. Uh, second will be on artificial intelligence, uh, whether, you know, ver various different forms of machine learning. A third that's kind of interesting will be on programming languages and developer tools. And I was particularly fascinated to see people that were looking at productivity languages and trying to get productivity, how, how do you deal with, with productivity or um, uh, interpreted languages at scale in, with performance in, in modern supercomputing systems? There's even, will even be talks there. Um, so de in the developer tools track. And uh, Aaron will be talking a little bit later this week about visualization, but, but um, visualization and particularly software visualization is a fascinating, uh, a fascinating topic for the large scales of machines. So if you happen to be coming to supercomputing, super please come a day or two early and join us uh, for the uh, HPC Developers Conference. Over time, we are hoping to migrate the conference to a, uh, a uh, independently run and juried conference for, for general parallel developers. We, we are definitely taking a step in that direction this year. While the platform will be Intel, the, the concepts are all general. And so uh, it should just be useful to everyone. Uh, I, I am also asked by uh, Dr. Pennycook to make a quick plug that I, we, are, we hope to have one of the talks in the parallel optimization path to be you know, a summary of the lightning talks or some of the best lightning talks from this and other uh, Xeon Phi user group uh, meetings. We'd love to have, you know, so if you have a, a great lightning talk, you know, please talk to John. We'd love to uh, talk about including that into the conference itself. Well, anyway, I wanted to, to just uh, quickly wrap up by saying thank you. Um, Xeon Phi started, um, it was not a norm, in, Intel, many of our products come from our own invention and great ideas, but it was born of a combination between research and customer requirements. Um, you know, the, you, many of you asked us to do this, uh, and it's been a massive investment, but it's been uh, worthwhile. The many core era really is here. Uh, Knight's Landing, by having a bootable CPU, um, that is capable of running at this kind of scale, you know, opens up, uh, you know, an entirely new era for us and hopefully for you. Thanks to the work that you're doing, the applications are, are beginning to arrive and beginning to arrive at scale. I'm, you know, I'm fascinated every day as I see the, the new results uh, pouring in uh, for, as people are bringing up and stabilizing their machines. I had a, a, a beer last night with one of, one of the uh, developers who's just really, really excited about uh, their new machine that's, that uh, is up and uh, already doing science. Um, you know, the, the, we're, we're taking a look not just at this particular problem, we, we're taking a look at kind of a more holistic approach to what the machines of 20, 20, 21, 22 end up needing to be. And the work we're doing is a critical step on the way to those deep, those, you know, deep petascale and exascale machines. Don't blink. Don't settle for an early result, and please don't settle just for a naive MPI port because you can get it to run. Really take a look at what, at what your targeted machines for the future will be and make wise choices in how you construct your programs for that because it's not something you want to be redoing every five years. We have numerous collaboration opportunities um, to enable these systems, um, you know, whether it's here at the user group, whether it's through parallel computing centers, whether it's through academic outreach, developer training, or student training. Um, you know, please, you know, use the, com use the opportunity that this community affords us to really help drive science for the next decades to come. 
um, that's what we set out to do. Uh, we're on our road. And uh, I want to thank you once again for coming out here. And I really do hope that uh, there's a, this is a great learning environment and it, 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 it um, helps spark knowledge for the, uh, you know, for the years to come. Thank you. Questions? So, so I have one about the, the path to kind of Knight's Mill is, is a little bit of a blip. Is that intended to be then integrated into future processors or is that a separate path now? Um, yeah, so officially, oh, we don't know. Uh, <laughs> unofficially, anything we're doing we, that, that is of use ends up coming back into the mainstream. So uh, expect, expect that it will merge back in. Uh, so um, the, 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 the history of Knight's Mill really, again, it's born of customer demand. We had uh, a, series, a, a series of developers that liked a lot of the stuff we're doing on Knight's Landing are already working hard on it, um, but we're looking for one more level of power performance and we were able to, we were able to, to look at that initially as a one-off, but yeah, it, it has to come back into the hole. Good, right, let's thank Joe again. And Yes.